diagnostic criteria everybody is very clear everything is being already discussed but i want that slide ruby that once again i'm going to insist that you know everybody have we shouldn't be getting uh, you know confused between who id psg ada dipsy it's dipsy 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 and dipsy in india it's 75 gram glucose very clear no it can be non fasting ogtt so in rural setup or in busy gynecology clinic where the appointments are very difficult it can be done on the opd basis even if patient has eaten he is not she is non fasting it can be done and the cut off is 140 so this is very clear next slide so glycemic targets we all know but 120 is a magic figure we should know that 120 is a figure which where if it is less than 120 then to us post glucose less than 120 if it is more than 140 okay the diagnosis of gdm is done and then you give trial of 2 weeks to 4 weeks for medical nutrition therapy and if still the targets are below 150 i mean targets come below 150 then it's only medical nutrition therapy and we don't require any medical management and what are the glycemic goals uh, basically to achieve good glycemic control and why do we treat gdm we basically treat gdm to prevent complications maternal and fetal to prevent ketosis to prevent hypoglycemia and to prevent hyperglycemia and to have a better maternal and fetal growth and you can see the you know whole lot of complications nowadays with so much of advent in advancement and technology and you know newer insulins and monitoring technique we don't get to see this stillbirth and macrosomia and you know uh, life threatening hypoglycemia in neonates you know thanks to conferences like this next slide So as I advise that OGTT more than one uh, forty, of course, seventy five gram glucose, MNT for two weeks, and if it is more than one twenty, then it is physical exercise and medical management. Everything has to be started along, uh, you know, uh, the medical management has to be started along with MNT and physical exercise. But if it is less than one twenty, you are able to achieve one uh, twenty uh, with uh, MNT, MNT, then no need for medical management. Next slide, please. so it is basically a carbohydrate controlled meal plan which provides adequate nutrition with appropriate weight gain and fetal well being you have to keep in mind the cultural preferences a south indian patient you cannot say that no car you know low carbs no idli no dosa you have to you know give the uh, preference to the culture and achieve normal glycemia preventing nutritional ketosis this is very very important next slide please so patients who are going to receive mnt they are going to require fewer patients are going to require insulin therapy if they adhere to their mnt they will have definitely decrease in hba1c perinatal complications among the infants are going to be less and lower birth weight lower percentage for you know gestational age less macrosomia these are the things which we are going to advise so as i mentioned at the beginning of the lecture that more than 90% of the gdm can be managed by mnt next slide please and this is just a small study you know of gdm 436 women and non diabetic women 254 women they were uh, you know uh, given a, a very good uh, mnt to gdm patients and uh, there was a group where mnt was not given and early diagnosis of gdm which is very crucial and early mnt intervention seemed to be beneficial in this study next slide please so if 90% gdm are going to be managed with mnt i think nutritionists are the cornerstone of the therapy with this i invite ruby to take ahead this lecture so ruby ruby you are going to hold my hand throughout the presentation thank you dr akshita for covering the few points before i go to the main practical aspects because now as you said that for diagnostic criteria also we have dipsy as the uh, main guiding force for us similarly there are several mnt guidelines given by different societies all over the world but we are going to stick to some guidelines given by indian uh, indian ministry of health and welfare india and also looking at the uh, suggestions coming from dipsy and the uh, ada here are the main uh, micronutrient division that we are looking at when we look at uh, mnt as you said earlier that it is a controlled carbohydrate diet we should also consider the other two macronutrients which is carbohydrate besides carbohydrate proteins and fats so how is the macronutrient distribution very very important and what should be the ideal distribution now typically we know that as an indian our diets are predominantly carbohydrate based more than 50, 60% of our diet whether north south east or west even the start study by dr shashank joshi 
thought that more than 60% of a diet is carbohydrate based. So for an MNT for GDM, ideally the amount of carbohydrate in your diet should be not more than 50%. Anywhere between 40 to 50% is acceptable. The protein in your diet for a GDM patient should typically be 20% and fat should not exceed 30% of fat. So we will first focus mainly on the carbohydrate because that's going to influence the glycemic uh, excursions. We are first looking at the total calories, whether carbohydrates, proteins or fats. Put together, the calories are also going to have an impact on the blood glucose levels. Now, how many calories are sufficient? We need to give calories so that there is optimum growth and development of the fetus. We need to avoid the postprandial hyperglycemia and we need to avoid excessive weight gain of the mother as well. So the ICMR NASH and the NIN guidelines of 2020 very clearly say that in the first trimester, there is no need to increase calorie intake. However, going further in the second trimester, 350 kilocalories should be increased, which should continue for third trimester also. Only if there is a twin pregnancy, the calorie should be increased by 700 kilocalories per day. Otherwise, you must stick to this kind of a chart, which will tell you how many calories should be given. So this is very easy and handy for doctors and dietitians to calculate the energy requirement during the pregnancy. Now, if it's a sedentary where most of the patients are sedentary in our uh, urban setup, 1900 kilocalorie is required for during pregnancy. But depending upon whether she's obese, she's underweight, normal weight, or we can adjust the caloric intake. So addition of 500 calories is given to those who are underweight. And you must reduce 500 kilocalories per day if the patient is uh, in the obese category or BMI about 24 as well. However, we know that for obese patients, we are a little more worried that the question is, do we make her lose weight? Do we cut down her calories? So it's very important to understand that in women with GDM, the excessive weight gain has been associated with increased risk of hypertension, cesarean section, and the last of gestational age babies. And a meta-analysis concluded that it's extremely important to prevent excessive weight gain in the GDM pregnancies. What happens is when the patient has already gained her weight, which is desired, her, it's very, very important to make sure that the weight doesn't go further beyond this. Stabilization is extremely important. So how many calories do we give to a patient who is obese and she has a GDM? We must reduce calories only 30 to 35% in her total calorie consumption on a daily basis. That is not only going to improve her sugars, but also reduce uh, the plasma triglyceride level. Make sure that the diet is somewhere between 1600 to 1800 kilocalories without leading to ketosis. Giving a diet which is 50% lesser than a total current intake actually is going to lead to ketosis, which must be avoided. So no diet less than 1500 kilocalories should be given to GDM patients. And we all know the uh, risks of ketosis. Now, if we uh, divide the macronutrients, carb, protein, and fat in the total caloric intake, the concentration should be mainly on the type of carbohydrates because the post-meal blood glucose level is going to depend completely on the kind of amount, uh, the type of carbohydrate, how much amount is uh, being eaten in a meal, and what is the digestion and absorption of the carbohydrate, particular in a meal or a given snack? Because that's going to directly have an impact on the blood glucose postprandial. So we need to divide the carbohydrates according to the uh, caloric requirement of the individual. So how do we calculate how many carbohydrates do we give and how do we distribute throughout the day? As we know, not more than 50%. And now we usually see women taking three to four meals. But for GDM patients especially, make sure that the patient is given three meals plus two to four snacks per day. That could include a bedtime snack as well. All in all, not more than 175 grams of carbohydrate is appropriate for the fetal growth and the cerebral development on the function of the child as well. So there's no need to cut down the carbohydrates beyond that. However, if you go very, very low, less than 39% of carbohydrate, it may result in a higher birth weight. And a low carbohydrate means the diet will be either high in protein or maybe high in fat also, which can again increase the risk of GDM and at-risk women. So keeping it this bracket of 40 to 50% is ideal. And distributing is very, very important. Again, there are uh, the, the current... Um, the patient's current uh, glycemic status will help us divide the carbohydrate intake. However, in general, the major three meals, breakfast, lunch and dinner, should have not more than 30% of carbohydrate. Like 20% for breakfast, 20% for lunch and 30% for dinner. And the snacks in between, like a mid-morning snack, a mid-evening snack and a bedtime snack, should not have more than 10% of carbohydrates coming from the total intake. This is especially very, very important for those who are in insulin. And to educate the patient on how and how much carbohydrate they should take, one must educate the patient that one serving is actually 15 grams of carbohydrate, which we call it as one carb unit. So just teach the patient one carb of unit 
means one slice of either a chapati one medium size chapati or it could be one cup of uh, curd or it could be one fruit like an as small apple or a sweet lime or an orange it could also be half a potato or it could also be if the patient is allowed bread could be one slice of bread potato also is considered as a high glycemic index carbohydrate which should be considered here uh so if the patient has to be given 3 serve 45 grams at one meal which is three servings that is 15 into 3 is 45 for breakfast lunch and dinner and both the snacks uh mid morning and mid evening should have only one to two serving means 30 grams of each only that is how we will adjust the carbohydrate counting so it's not only the amount of carbohydrate we should focus on we should also look at the type of carbohydrate so especially the ca ca simple carbohydrates which are like the sweets the processed fruit juices and aerated drinks which are going to spurge the blood sugar levels are completely no no for these patients the focus should be on the complex carbohydrates especially those which are low in glycemic index this kind of a chart is self explanatory which can be given to the patients there are three types of uh, carbohydrates low in gi high in gi and moderate gi so in every food group for example if you look at the right hand side if you see the set of vegetables here you will find that the boiled potato is the highest in terms of gi whereas other vegetables are low in uh, gi among the fruits you'll find watermelon being the highest in terms of gi and other fruits apple orange even banana and the mango again the amount and the type uh, the variety of the fruit will decide and looking at the roti and the wheat and the cereals if you look at the bread any type of bread other than the whole grain bread is either a high or a medium gi bread uh, looking at other uh, rice varieties you can allow the patient to have either a mulgiri rice a barley rice or basmati rice which is a medium gi rice no no to a kolam rice or a small grain rice which is available so this kind of a red orange and green signaling system can be shared with the patient which will allow them to choose which food from which particular food group that's very very important because more, many many guidelines on mnt for gdm have recommended a low to moderate gi a meta analysis of five randomized clinical trials with 302 patients also showed that low gi reduced the risk of macrosomia another meta analysis uh, involving 1985 women showed that low gi has a positive effect on the maternal outcomes and uh, avoids the risk adverse outcome on the newborns as well Uh, this systemic uh, review, which uh, very clearly indicates that, uh, as compared to the low GI total energy restriction and the low carbohydrate, only low GI is the best in terms of the outcome. Now, the limit trial is, uh, similarly gives us a hands-on for the low GI diet. Choosing the amount of fiber, especially the soluble fiber, up to 28 grams, is going to really have a blunting response on the proteolytic response. So, suggest the patient to take fruits. uh is a gold flax seeds oat bread and pulses which have got the skill like a whole pulse proteins how much do we give only 9.5 grams in addition during the second trimester and 22 grams in the third trimester so it's not only going to add protein but also blunt the post grand prandial spikes now giving uh, fibrous uh, dals like the dals with the husk is going to increase the fiber and the protein growth so as the pregnancy advances change the ratio from cereal to pulse to increase the pulse and reduce the cereal for example in a dal khichdi increase the amount of dal and reduce the amount of rice as the trimester progresses it's also going to increase the satiety value of that particular meal how do we achieve the total protein intake give a patient 2 to 3 cups of dal a thick pulse two egg whites for those who are non vegetarian and about one cup or so about 150 grams of chicken or fish for the non vegetarians and the type of uh, protein also has been in light uh, in recent past the there has been a debate whether animal protein or plant protein is better and there are some studies which show that uh, plant protein is much much better because of the kind of branch chain amino acids and the other amino acids present in the animal protein so some suggest study suggest uh, preference of plant protein over the animal protein so you can add any type of protein to your meals in different forms like powders or milk or nuts are a very good source of protein which can be given to the patients and when it comes to fat the last macronutrient of the discussion yes adding more fats is going to increase the weight of these patients so focus on uh, fats which are healthier fats make sure that the uh, saturated fats are less than uh, 10% not more than 30 grams of visible fat only 20 ml that is 4 teaspoons of cooking oil is allowed per day there should be good focus on the omega 6 and the omega 3 ratio and up to 200 mg of dha is very essential especially in the patients who are pregnant 
and uh, certain uh, of good fats which should be suggested uh, during the uh, pregnancy is mufa so what you can do is you can include these nuts olive oil or any uh, snack made out of this uh, which is enriched in uh, mufa giving omega 3 either in the form of walnuts or chia seeds or fish is a very good option of course choosing the fish in pregnancy is extremely important to avoid low mercury fishes such as pomfret travers catfish and up to 350 grams of fish can be kept on a weekly basis avoid all the bad fats and keep the saturated fats less than 10% the intake of coconut oil should be moderate the total dietary cholesterol which is usually found in the animal fat should be less than 300 ml all the vanaspatis the ghee and the red meat should be completely uh, restricted in these diets uh, and i think uh, once we understand the type of carbohydrate proteins and fat we will be able to give a better and a easy to comply diet plan to the patients uh i will continue by giving you certain practical tips so there are four practical tools that i can give to all of you which we usually practice in a uh, in opd setup one is breakfast split how to split your breakfast the meal frequency how to choose which uh, macronutrient first and the double plate method Now, first, if I show you the concept of split the breakfast. Suppose this patient is you uh, consuming about three with the palms or four at least. Suggest the patients that uh, split into two with a difference of one hour. Studies have shown the distribution of carbohydrates at the breakfast is going to help improve the post meal excursion. So instead of having three with the palms at one time, take one and a half with the palm at uh, say about nine o'clock in the morning, and an hour late you can have the remaining. One and a half uh, utta palms, or two at least um, in the gap of two hours each. There are other breakfast options, giving egg and giving paneer, which will reduce the glycemic index, and that will help reducing the postprandial blood glucose levels. And so it's very very important in the morning because of the increased insulin resistance, secondary to the dawn phenomena, which is commonly seen. Okay, and these women have a deficiency in the first phase insulin secretion, and to match this insulin deficiency. We need to have smaller quantity of food, less number of carbohydrates at one time. So it's important to give less food and in a split form. The other trick is not to give only three major meals. Besides breakfast, lunch, and dinner, give two more meals. So if you can see this blue line, which the parent, the patient takes only three meals, there is a huge spike. However, as compared to that, if you give meals regularly after every three three hours, the spike is not so high. The patient. Tends to eat lesser amount of uh, food as well as less amount of carbohydrate ingestion gives this kind of a blunting response. Uh, the third very important is the sequence of eating, which we usually, you know, uh, tell every patient who comes for counselling that first, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, include proteins in the diet as much as possible. Whether these are eggs, nuts, curd, paneer, or dals, you know, that's going to actually give you more satiety also and reduces the glycemic. After that, you can take your cereal based, whether it is your chapati or whether it is your poha, upma, or South Indian idlis. The sequence of eating should be very, very critical. And same is for the lunch and dinner. First, you take the uh, fiber and the protein, whether it is your bhaji or the salad, that should go first. After five ten minutes, then you should start eating your chapati with the remaining bhaji or the remaining dal. But the rice and the chapati should come in the second. So this should be the order of the eating. another way to explain a patient is those who are especially those who have a greater appetite tell them to take the plate which is only 9 inches in diameter very easy to understand fill half your plate with vegetables first and these should be non starchy not a potato lot of green vegetables lot of other vegetables can be added only one fourth of your plate should have carbohydrates whether it is a chapati or bread or rice and the remaining one fourth should focus on the dal or the chicken or the fish and in addition to that the patient can be allowed to take Curd or buttermilk with both the meals. Uh, I think if we implement this, we will be able to case uh, solve cases like this. So, Dakshita, I would request you to show yeah, share so this. Yeah, so Ruby, uh, can we just go through this one case? She is an elderly mm -hmm. primary, thirty-six year old female, sixty-six uh, kg, not very overweight, I would say. She already had history of PCOS, hypothyroidism, and she has, uh, uh, you know, conceived through ART. And now this is twenty weeks of gestation, sugar fasting around one twenty-four, OGTT is showing one fifty-seven, and A one C around six point seven. Naturally, she is thirty-six year old. Any pregnancy is precious, but this pregnancy is precious. Mom is diabetic and father had uh, fatty liver disease. Uh, next slide. So this is her diet sheet looks like. 
very high cup you can see i am not going to read it with the you know constraint of time but if you see dinner is always rice 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 after dinner she is having something sweet at the 28th week of gestation as well so i would like you to give her some practical tips so that she can adhere to the diet sheet yeah so we may not see junk or too much sugar because she is not yeah. having sugar in the milk okay only one tea cup of sugar in the cup of tea uh, like i discussed the previous slides how do we utilize or implement those principles in this time so what we can do is begin the day with not with a carbohydrate rich toast or rusk or biscuit but with some amount of fat and protein so nuts would be the ideal choice that is some almonds some walnuts can give good amount of fat and protein both and that will not spike up the blood glucose early in the morning Now her breakfast, which is usually looks like a simple uh, carbohydrate like sabu dana and there's rice based idlis or bread sometimes, and there's also along with that one cup of tea with sugar, and sometimes she also eats bread and jam. Here uh, we can always give her better suggestions to include protein, like I suggested earlier. Whatever breakfast is given, split into two. The quantity should be so she can have part of the breakfast at nine thirty, the remaining part at ten thirty. We need to split this. You can avoid tea along with the breakfast because. Uh, anemia is also a big concern to us. So, uh, combining tea with uh, food is not going to be the right way to eat. Now, looking at the next meal of hers, she has a lunch at twelve forty-five, and she eats a banana after her lunch or with her lunch every day, which is actually going to increase the glycemic load of the meal. So, this should be avoided. And with chapati and vegetable, a protein and some salad can be added to reduce the glycemic load of this meal. Directly after uh, lunch, her three o'clock uh, meal actually is. Some nashta, which is like a poha or a maggi or bale or chips, all these refined carbohydrates should be out of this. She can either take a protein supplement with milk or some nuts again at this time. She has a large gap between three pm and nine pm. So in between the two meals, we can include a mid evening snack. So which can be either a complex carb or a protein rich snack at five thirty. It could either be a protein rich or a boiled egg also or some paneer. One hundred grams can be taken at this time. Now dinner, of course, is slightly late. Can be re-look shifted to seven thirty eight pm. As uh, Dr. Lakshmi said, her it's majorly rice based. We need to make sure that she has um, more vegetables in the dinner and avoid rice on a daily basis. That can be once or twice a week. We can include chapati or even a millet based uh, meal can be included in dinner. But lump sum amount of vegetables and fiber has to be there. Though this is a protein rich meal, because we know that a mistake is to consume. Uh, after in a one piece of chocolate or ice cream or like we can look at snacks we can look at uh, munching some peanuts at this time walking she is doing only after the dinner we must encourage that she walks after the major meal which is lunch as well so lunch and dinner post walk meal walk can be very very helpful so only doing a minor changes will help us and not completely 360 degree changing her that so that's what is very very important she will adhere to the diet only if she is given only slight changes and when you are giving Counseling to such a patient ensure you check her previous blood sugar reading. If she is facing nausea, vomiting, we need to do the necessary changes. Give a very very simple diet like the suggestion which I may told you right now is very simple to follow, and you can also give it in a very local language. Whichever food is available locally, you must only suggest to her. If she is a North Indian, you cannot force her to take idli. If she is a South Indian, you cannot force her to take paratha. So slight changes with the change of ingredient will be very very helpful. Give her a list what she needs to eat rather than what she does not need to, eat. and follow it up to understand whether there is an improvement in the blood sugar reading. That's how we will be able to modify diet for her. And in Robi, we can uh, skip next four five slides, which are uh, you know standard slides, and we can straight away go to the discussion. So that Dr. Smita, Sha, I mean Dr. Ritu, uh, Smita, ma'am, sub everybody can join. Dr. Panchal, Dr. Day, he is here. So in five minutes, we can just take the challenges which we are facing. The last yeah. slide, if we can. So here, when if the patients are of different uh, regions, we must modify the diet as per where they belong to and the locally foods which are available. That really make the adherence and compliance very very big. Because for every GDM patient, we need to individualize the diet plan. But there are some very very important challenges that we that we all face that I think we will discuss at length now. There are many issues and points that we can take up right now. Yeah, since Ritu is here, see, Ritu is known to be a technology queen. So, Ritu, what is your experience about CGMS? You know, especially patients who are uh, on the nutrition therapy, who are not on insulin or any, uh, for that matter, metformin as well. So, what are your uh, uh, experiences about uh, CGMS? Use of CGMS in patients. Absolutely, thank you so much. Carbs. I think uh, very, very critical. to have you know if the patient is counseled well and if the patient is really ready 
CGMS is like a boon because you know for patients in practice when they also see the value of looking at their glucose in real time and are able to make changes to their insulin or to their diet as well then it really makes a lot of difference in being able to bring up the kind of control that we are looking at the a1c or the sugar control as well so definitely cgms is kind of a boon for both the doctor as well as the patient when it comes for gvm but yes um, <clears throat> the bigger question is the affordability and the understanding of the patient and the relatives so you may use you know one or two sensors during the entire uh, three trimester course but definitely the first trimester and the third trimester are some places where the guidance on nutrition becomes absolutely easy if you can do the cgms patients do understand the value of you know the kind of dietary call that ruby has just given us tips on or like you were also mentioning that you know there are literatures which talk about how to get that optimal control yes uh, smita ma'am uh, the practical yeah. issues can i ask my question to smita ma'am Yes. yes smita so ma'am um, uh, the science is different we advise uh, diet to the you know uh, most motivated diabetic patient who is a gdm patient but finally yes. it is social and cultural background as well she is probably um, you know daughter in law in that house or a mother of one child so how difficult do you find you know this macronutrient redistribution for her uh, you know in the whole diet plan do you change the whole kitchen uh, kitchen recipe of that family or only for her or the customized diet sheet is given no actually at uh, the first meeting at uh, the first time when she come to me we generally guide him regarding the most probably uh, in our gujarat uh, all the patients are uh, using more carbohydrate diet you know so we focus on carbohydrate restriction first and explain the uh, effects of the carbohydrate on the post prandial blood sugar and they put him to in the ameliorative glucose profile so when we put them on the agp so definitely they will check and after one week we call them and we show the results of their diet okay what you are doing we prescribe them the protein breakfast and they are not having protein breakfast so their sugar will be go up and we show them hey oh, you have take poha in the breakfast and you can see the spike in your blood sugar so Uh, we have to motivate them we have to educate them and continuous glucose monitoring it will I have i like to add something here to what smita ben is saying so all these changes like you know to change the protein and all i think if we just change the recipe of the food ingredient just that yes. so she doesn't have to cook of course a separate, uh, separate and that's a big modification uh, as per cultural food. diet and the modification that is the most important if the patient is the you say that they are a rice eater so we change in the rice and put some dal and all kind of the preparation we have so many uh, diet recipes that include the fiber and low glycemic index so we give them the recipes and uh, uh, that like and dislike because in the pregnancy they don't eat the food that they don't like so we as per that we have so many we prepare the so many recipes for that and we give them the recipes which uh, low glycemic index and they can help them so that is the uh, we treat them Ritu, I think you are keeping uh, track of time. Are we done, or do yes, we have yes. some time? Um, we'll just, in the interest of time, we'll just take one last question. Yes. Um, so you want to ask something, or maybe I have just one simple question. I think you know very clearly. You all have been practicing, and uh, like you mentioned, Dr. Dakshita, that you know the nutrition becomes the most essential piece when it comes to uh, you know managing the glycemic values of these patients. So, Ruby, last question to you. Uh, how do you see patients picking up these practical tips because you know we've been talking since morning that the most important thing is acceptability by the patient that is at most important you know we may talk a to z about what is needed to be done what are the recommendations but how do you see the adaptiveness of these patients to actually imbibe these cultural tips well in real setup you'll find that among all the pregnant women those who are gdm are the best patients for all of us in terms of compliance to the diet and most of them are gdm either they have a history of pcos or they have uh, a late pregnancy most of them have the reason so for them pregnancy is very 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 precious and not only her it's the entire family who uh, you know knows this and who's undergone the whole art process that's why i took this case which is undergone a art for such a patient 
everything will be up to the T. Her adherence and compliance will be exactly as per what you suggest. So even do, whether doing a CGM or uh, changing the ingredients of the recipe, everything is possible provided the entire family comes together and wants his child to be healthy and the mother to be child. So my suggestion to all those who are pregnant, the counseling should not be given only to the woman who is pregnant, but also to the other family members, her husband and a mother-in-law, a caregiver, so that everybody accepts it. That is the ultimate key for adherence and compliance. And do not change the diet plan 360 degrees. We change step by step. And as the sugar improves, her compliance becomes better and better. Her CGM is a and but the CGM convincing someone for CGM is not very easy. But if it is done, it also saves her uh, multiple pricks, which is also a, a very, very great advantage of doing a CGMS. Uh, so I think the only basic is where keep it very, very simple, local, regional, and very economical. I think that's how and a complete synchrony between the treating team, the doctor, which is either an endo or a diabetologist and a gynecologist who will convince her the same thing and a diabetes educator if she's in place. Put together, I think it's not such a difficult diet. It's just a diet with slight modifications. Wonderful. I think that's brilliant. Last closing line by Dr. Dakshita on your key takeaway message for macronutrients in uh, GDM. Yeah, I think last line is uh, teaching GDM patient macronutrient dis that, uh, you know distribution is very important. But I think teaching macronutrient distribution to all the pubertal girls who are between 7 to 10 standards, who are going to develop PCOD or probably GDM or probably obesity will take us long way. So grassroots prevention level should happen at the school level when they are you know, uh, on the process of becoming a woman. Thank you so much.